Two weeks ago, I spoke about the prophet Isaiah, and I said <clears throat> at the time that I am sometimes justifiably accused of being a person of a somewhat gloomy nature. But I said on that occasion that um, if I'm gloomy, the prophet Isaiah makes me seem like Norman Vincent Peale. Now, maybe, maybe the reference to Norman Vincent Peale went over some people's heads. I don't know. Uh, it might date me a little bit, but when I was probably 14, 15, I read The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. And I determined that I was going to become a positive person, a perky, happy, positive person, always looking on the sunshiny side of life and always seeing the best in every situation. And, you know, I don't know, probably lasted for three weeks. And then I went back to being, to being Eeyore. But to be fair to me, if Isaiah was gloomy two weeks ago, this morning, Isaiah takes gloomy to a whole new level. And he makes my Eeyore seem a little bit like Tigger by, by comparison. Isaiah the prophet is seriously, seriously in chapter 64, is seriously in a funk. He is in a bad place. He calls it a wilderness. He said, speaking to God, your holy cities have become a wilderness. Zion has become a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. Our holy and beautiful house where our ancestors praised you has been burned by fire and all our pleasant places have become ruins. Could be describing to some degree, it seems to me, people's experience these days of COVID. Go downtown sometime and you may feel like Victoria has become a bit of a desolation. Our beautiful house, this place that I'm in and none of you are, although it's true, it hasn't been burned, but it is the place where our ancestors worshiped and where you all have gathered to praise God and bring heart opening into this place. It hasn't been burned by fire, but it is a little desolate in here right now. I am all by myself in this big building and you are all in your homes. Our pleasant places have become almost like ruins. But if that's not bad enough, it, it actually gets even worse um, in the prophet Isaiah. And there's a chunk um, that we read this morning. We read two, two bits. Judith read it exactly as it was assigned, but she was assigned to leave out verses five, six, and seven. Because five, verses five to seven are seriously unhappy. The verses that Judith didn't read this morning from the prophet Isaiah speaking to God say, you meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your rays, but you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself. We transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Whoa. He really, really needs help. He is seriously unhappy. And, you know, I think it's really important that we read those verses on this Joy Sunday 
Because I think we need to take away, as I was trying to say to the children earlier, we need to take away from this in part that it's okay to feel unhappy. There's lots of things to be unhappy about right now in our lives, in the world, in our communities, in the church. There are a lot of things that might well make us feel unhappy. And that's okay. Unhappy does not last forever. As we'll see in a few moments, even Isaiah had some slightly more encouraged moments in his life. The really important question, of course, is not, am I never going to feel unhappy? Because that's just not realistic. The important question is, how am I going to respond to unhappy? How am I going to respond when, like Isaiah, I find myself feeling in a wilderness place, in a desolation place, in a, in a forsaken place? How am I going to choose to respond at those times in my life when the darkness doesn't feel so holy? It just feels dark. Well, Isaiah, Isaiah has, a, has a great first response to when you find yourself feeling unhappy. In this part we read, Judith read at the beginning of that reading, Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1, Isaiah praying out to God, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that nations might tremble at your presence. So Isaiah's first response to unhappy is, God, come down and smite the earth with fire. Purify us. Destroy my enemies. Make things better. I was, uh, I was biking home the other day from the church along my usual route. And my usual route takes me across the middle of the Cedar Hill Golf Course on a trail. It's a trail that is clearly designated for bikes, but shared with pedestrians. But there's a sign on both ends of the trail that clearly designate that trail as a trail that bikers are authorized to use. Put that piece of information in your mind. So I'm biking along and I come to a corner and I see a man and a woman and a dog. The, the man's got the dog and the woman is walking beside. She is looking up and she sees me right away. He is looking down, I guess, at the dog. And I see her lean over and say something to him. And she moves to the side. He looks up and sees me approaching now very slowly, approaching him. And finally, reluctantly, he moves a little bit to one side. At which point, just as I go by, he turns to his wife and growls, he's not supposed to be biking here anyway. And I prayed, oh Lord, that you would tear open the heavens and come down and smite that guy. Not my best response. Unfortunately, I was on my bike, so I just kept going. But you know, to be fair to me and Isaiah, I'm not the first person, we're not the first people in the world facing hardship and facing opposition to pray that God would smite our enemies. In Luke's gospel, Luke tells us that Jesus and his disciples were on the way into a village of the Samaritans. They were going to get things ready for for Jesus, but the Samaritans didn't receive them, didn't welcome them. And then Luke says, when Jesus' disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Isn't that a great idea? These guys aren't welcoming us. They're not being nice to us. God, how about if we just command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. 
What's he doing rebuking his own disciples? They're the good guys in this story. But, you know, calling down fire from heaven on our enemies may not be the ideal response to opposition. So there needs to be, there needs to be another way. And Isaiah does point to the possibility of another way through the wilderness, of another experience that we can have in a bleak time if we open our hearts to it. He introduces it with one tiny but very important little word. After praying for the heavens to open and the fire to come down and the earth to quake and God to do awesome deeds, Isaiah says, yet, yet, O Lord. And this comes, you know, I imagine it coming in a much quieter voice. Yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay. And you are the potter. We are all the works of your hand. Even in his darkest moments, even when he was most gloomy, Isaiah the prophet understood that God could be trusted. Life can be trusted. We are not alone. As desolate as things may at times appear, we have not been forsaken. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came into the wilderness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. There is light in the wilderness. Life can be trusted. That's why this is the joy Sunday. Joy is not happy. Joy is deeper. Joy is more profound. Joy says that even when everything is in turmoil, I know there is a reality deeper than my surface experience. And I can trust that. And I look at Jesus and I see the turmoil and the pain and the suffering of his life. And I look at his mother, Mary, and I see the anguish that she experienced. And I see also in them a light and a truth and a beauty that is everlasting. This morning, as I was thinking more about all of this, I opened my beautiful St. Philip unique online Advent calendar. And I was faced with an amazing song. I don't think it comes from a particularly Christian background, but it speaks of this kind of awareness of the reality of darkness and of the possibility that in the midst of darkness, we might be able to find hope and light, and a reality that can be trusted. So I want to play you this song. This isn't quite the video that was shared online, but listen to the words and listen to the voices and just allow yourself to trust the goodness of the clear blue morning. It's been a dark night and I've been waiting for the morning it's been a long hard fight but I can see a brand new day dawning and I've been looking for the sunshine 
Scott Harris. 